Hello everyone. Today I wanted to make a short video going over perhaps the most important fundamental when learning React, which is props. Props in React are how we get data around our application. It's something that I think many new programmers struggle with greatly just because of the unfamiliar and sometimes confusing syntax. So let's dive in. What is a prop? Well, an important part of React is JSX. And this is this HTML-like syntax that we see here with our div. The goal of JSX is to allow us as web developers to use a familiar HTML-like syntax when creating our custom and reactive components. So it looks a lot like HTML. If I come over to my inspector, we take a look at actual HTML, we see some similarities, right? We both have divs and they both have this key value pair here. This name equals some value. In HTML, we call this div an element, and we call this key value pair an attribute. ID is the name of our attribute, and root is its value. You might be familiar with some other attributes like class, href, source. In React, we have slightly different names for these things. This name right here is a component, and the key value pairs that it has are called props. This is an individual prop. Note that we say class name here instead of class, because class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript. So that's what a prop is, is it's an attribute. It's using that familiar syntax that we have from HTML to assign values to the things that we're putting onto the page. Before I get any further with why we decided to use this syntax, I want to talk about functions. In JavaScript and most other programming languages, our concept of a function is borrowed from mathematics. So in your algebra class, you might have a function f of x, right? f is our function name and x is its argument. f might take more than one, let's say x and y, and this is fine. It's familiar to us and it works decently well. If I have, for example, an add function, I can return x plus y, and this is intuitive enough to me when I'm calling my function, right? It's going to add these two numbers together. The order doesn't matter, I just got to put them in there. And sometimes this order lends meaning to us. So for example, if we have a division function, right? we have a numerator and a denominator. And reading left to right, I would expect my division function to make the left-hand value the numerator and the right-hand value the denominator, right? That makes sense. The position matters here. Um, and there are some cases where we have a small number of arguments. So the position doesn't really matter, but we can deal with whatever arbitrary set that we've decided to use. So if I were to recreate the map function in JavaScript, it could take an array and a callback function, right? And this is fine. You know, I'm, I'm happy doing this, right? And then putting whatever callback I want in here. And I could reverse these, but it doesn't really matter. I just have to learn what order that is, accept it, and move on with my life. However, this paradigm starts to break down when we have a lot of arguments. So let's imagine a function that processes some information about a person. Right? And what information might we have about a person? Well, we could have a name. We could have an age, we could have a location, a job, a hair color, a height, an eye color, right? And now if I were to try to invoke this function without looking at the definition, okay, so it is process person and it was name, age, location, job, 
high color. I don't remember. <laughs> right? That's very confusing for me trying to remember what values they even are. But also, if I just look at what I've done here, I don't know what this means. I don't know what these values end up being when they're used inside of my function. So the the virtue of them being in some order for them having posi position does not matter. And in fact, that might make some things difficult. Because in JavaScript, we can give a function as many or as few arguments as we feel like at any given time. I don't have to give process person all of these arguments. And that's nice because that means that I can make some arguments optional, right? I might not always need hair color, height, and eye color to do what I need to do when processing this person's data. However, it gets a little weird when, for example, I don't know the person's hair color, but I do need their height. Well, I can't just put the height here because that's what hair color is. So I have to put an undefined here in order to get to where I need to give my height. And that's terrible. I don't like that. No one likes that. So um, we've discovered a point with which our math style function arguments don't really do what we need them to. What a lot of other languages have to help solve this problem is the notion of named arguments. So instead of giving these arguments via a position, I could give them via a name. So I could say process person name is equal to Henry, age is equal to 26, job is equal to whatever I want. And you might now recognize that this is essentially our exact syntax for props, but JavaScript doesn't actually have this. So before we get to props, let's talk a bit more about how we solve this problem in JavaScript without JSX. Well, we don't have this style of named arguments, but what we do have is objects. What I can do is instead of declaring all of these individual arguments that I want to give, so I can say, you know what, process person is going to accept an object called person. And now I, as the caller, excuse me, now I, as the caller of this function, can give named values to this object because I can simply open up a set of curly braces and make a new object literal where name can be Henry. And you know what? Age can come before this, right? Because the order doesn't matter in my object. And now this has become very easy. And inside of my function, I can still access all of this data. You know, I can do person.age, person.name, whatever I need to do. It's all still there. But now I have the virtue of the names of my values mattering, the names of my argument matter, not their position, right? But we've lost an important thing here, which is documentation. When we have this version of process person, it's very easy to know what pieces of data this function expects right? Name, age, location, job, hair color, height, eye color. Here, I just know it needs a person. What is a person? Well, I would have to scour the body of this function to see where I used person.age or person.name. And that's not very nice to me as a developer. So instead, what we can do is we can make use of a very powerful feature in JavaScript called destructuring. What destructuring does is it allows us to intelligently take data outside of a structure, destructure. So let's look at an example. Let's say I have an array, R, and it is values 1 and 2. I want these values um, 
in variables. So I'm going to create a variable called first, and this is going to be the first element of the array. I'm going to do the same thing for second. Right? This is pretty verbose. What I wish there was was a way for me to just get first and second directly out of this array. And in fact, there is. It's called destructuring. What it allows me to do is it allows me to put a data structure on the right-hand side, which can be this literal array, one and two, or it could be a variable containing an array. It doesn't matter. And on the right-hand side, instead of putting one variable name, right, I can mimic the data structure on the right-hand side. I can say, you know what, I know my right-hand side is going to be an array. And I just want the first value of this array to be in a variable called first, and for the second value to be in a variable called second. And this is going to work out exactly like this. First and second are going to be those two values. JavaScript is going to see that I have the same shape of data on both sides, and it is going to extract the one to a variable named first and extract the two to a variable named second. And that is destructuring for arrays. The position matters, right? Just like our argument list. It's essentially an argument list is, is kind of what we're doing here. We can also destructure objects. And the way that works, right, is we have the same data structure on each side. So let's have a person object, Henry, and 26 are our name and age values. And then on the left-hand side, position doesn't matter, right? In an object, the position of my keys isn't important. It's their names that are important. So if I wanted to get name and age into some variables, I would on this left-hand side, in a set of curly braces, right? Same data structure on both sides. I would say, I want the name value to be in a variable called name, and I want the age value to be in a variable called age. And this would have a name as Henry and age as 26. Right. So that's how we destructure an object. Position isn't important, the name is. Whenever I name my variable here, JavaScript is gonna look inside of the object on the right-hand side for the key with the same name. So I could easily switch these up, do it like this. Everything is still going to work just fine. Age will be 26, name will be Henry. So how is this of use to us? Well, one, it can save on writing person dot whatever a whole bunch of times. And two, now I can on the first line of this function destructure my person object and get name, age, job, hair color, location, eye color, height, whatever. Right? And now we have much better documentation for what this person object actually is and what this function requires. In fact, JavaScript is so kind to us that we can do destructuring directly inside of the argument list. So I can do it on line one here, or I can do it directly in this argument list. Right? It's going to do the same thing. It's going to take the argument, right, which is implicitly called person. It doesn't really matter what its name is because I'm just going to extract the values that I need directly into these named variables. And look, we've essentially got the same syntax here, but we've gone from this very horrible bad way of calling our function, where nothing makes sense, to having this very nice, well-named way of calling our function. Now, some people believe in always writing their functions in this style. And I will admit it has a number of benefits. It allows us to get around that whole position optionality thing. Um, it lets us easily remove arguments, right? Let's say, you know what, I don't need job anymore. If we were to remove job from our position-based argument list, 
Well, now I have to go find everywhere someone called process person and remove job from that uh, argument list because now everything is in the wrong order. When I do that with my object version, with my named argument version, well, it doesn't really matter that I'm still giving in job. I should probably remove it, but it's not going to break anything, right? It doesn't affect the order. It doesn't affect any of the other values that we need, right? So that's totally fine. Now, I'm not dogmatic about this. I think it depends on the situation, but some people find this to be the one true way to write JavaScript functions. And in fact, that's what we end up doing with React components. This is how every React component works. Props is a single object that is passed as an argument to our components, and we should work with it in the exact same way. So let's take a look. I'm going to declare a custom component. I'm going to call it person. It is a function that returns some JSX. I'm just going to make it a div. right? And what this is going to do is it is going to accept a single argument that we, out of tradition, call props. Because this is my function, I can name this whatever I want, but you should probably name it props just because that's what other React programmers are going to expect. Now, if you're just starting out with React, one of your most common bugs is going to be the wrong prop names, the wrong prop values, confusion on where your data is, how it's getting passed around, what name it's under. So when you're starting out, it would be very, very nice, both for me and you, if you could, at the top of each one of your components, say, you know what, I'm going to log the name of this component and the props that it has received. And then just look in your console, because a lot of the time, right, it's not going to be what you expect. And before you go hunting around some big logical error in your program, you just need to change a name of something. So let's go ahead and render our person component and see what happens. Well, when we console log the props here for person, we see that it is an empty object. And that's because every React component is going to accept this one object as its only argument, props. Now we can give person some props. For example, I can say name is Henry. The age is 26. Note that when we're inside of JSX, whenever I need to do JavaScript things, like write a number, or call a function, or declare a function, or do some math, I do so inside of a set of curly braces. Now in JSX, this first set of curly braces doesn't mean an object, it just means I'm about to do some JavaScript, like a number. So when our page refreshes, we see that the props object that is getting console logged now has a key named Henry and a value, I'm sorry, <laughs> a key named name, and it has a value of Henry and a key named age and a value of 26, right? This is the immutable law of names and values. Whenever we have a name of some data goes on the left-hand side and its value goes on the right-hand side. When I declare a variable, right, the name, variable, left-hand side, its value, right-hand side. When I have an object, the key name, left-hand side, value, right-hand side. When I use a prop, the prop name, left-hand side, the value, right-hand side. This is how it goes. Names on the left-hand side, values on the right-hand side. So when I give a prop named Henry, mm, when I give a prop named name with a value of Henry, it ends up in this props object as a prop named name with a value of Henry. Right? Props is an object, has a key called name, value is equal to Henry. So 
That's how we use props. We can render them by saying our person has a name and it is going to be the value props.name, right? Whenever I'm doing JavaScript inside my JSX, I need my curly braces and I'm just going to access the value of the key name of the props object and let's get our age in here too. Props.age. And that works. That works perfectly. However, we've run into some problems that we encountered when talking about functions of this style, which is what are props? What props does person need? Well, I don't know. And you're going to see in your React career, you're going to see components that don't fit on a single screen in your React application, right? And so now I have no idea what props person expects. I would have to search through this component and find every invocation of props dot something. That's a very bad developer experience for me. I could write some comments on here, right, of what props is, you know, props is name and age, but one of the problems with comments is that they're not enforced. So I could very easily change what the code expects these props to be, but forget to update the comment. Right? Comments, it's very easy to get out of sync with what is actually happening in our program. So if we can, it's good to try to write our program to enforce those rules on its own. And we can do that by making use of destructuring. Right? We can say on line 2, normally on line 1, but while you're learning React, please console log your props. I'm going to say name and age is equal to props. Right. Now, I can also save on some keystrokes. I don't have to say props.name. I can just use name and age directly. Boom. Still works. But now, when I'm trying to figure out what props I need to give to the person component, I can find it right here. Just as easy. And to go a step further, we can do this directly in our argument list. Right? Now this looks a lot more like a function. This comes with the downside of not being able to console log your props as easily. It doesn't really matter which one you use. There's some slight technical differences, but I would be flabbergasted if you ran into them. Um, so do whichever one you feel more comfortable with. I love destructuring my props in the argument list, but you can do it, you know, a couple lines down. Some people, again, believe dogmatically that you should always destructure props and never use props.something. I fall into that camp. I will go ahead and claim strongly that I think you should always destructure props. It enables you to add some documentation to your functions and components immediately, as well as you don't have to write props.something. It saves you some, some keystrokes and some space inside of your components. So I'm just going to go ahead and say always destructure your props. Right? If you're unfamiliar with destructuring, play around with it instead of avoiding it. You're going to enjoy it a great deal. I will be bold enough to make that claim. So um, that is props in a nutshell. Right? Keys, values, names on the left hand side, values on the right, they get collected up into this big object. If that's still giving you a bit of trouble, let's test it. It's important when we're learning how to program and engaged in the act of programming that we constantly test what we know. It may be the most fundamental skill we can have because whenever you're debugging your program because something went wrong, it means that something that you thought you knew about the state of your program is incorrect. So it's important to be able to test and prove your knowledge because oftentimes you're wrong. And going through that test is going to help you figure out how you're wrong. So let's test what I said, right? Our component is a function. It's a function that accepts a single argument that is an object. We call that object props. In the case of person, props is an object that contains the keys name and age. When we run this function, 
it returns JSX. Inside of JSX, we can open up a set of curly braces and we can do JavaScript in here, right? So if I say curly braces one plus one, a two shows up there. Theoretically, I can call my person function, right? Person is a function, I can call it, nothing wrong with that. Person is a function that expects an object as an argument that has the values of name and age. When I call this function, it should give me back some JavaScript. There we go. That works, right? I'm able to prove to myself what prompts are. And these syntaxes, virtually identical, right? Here, we just have this in our JSX in our HTML-like fashion, whereas here, this is the JavaScript version, right? Person is a function that accepts an object full of named arguments, right? This is what our prompts are. Now, it would be very nice if you never did this, if you never called one of your components as a function, because if you do that, someone's going to look at you funny, ask where you learned that, they're going to point at me, and I'm going to get yelled at. So don't do this. Um, there is an important technical difference as to why we don't. You can find it by trying to use hooks <laughs> inside of this. It's going to break. Don't call your um, component functions like this. But do know right, that this is effectively how props work. Props are collected into an object that is given as the first and only argument to your component. There you have it. That's props. I encourage you to play around with them. Please remember to console log your props when you're learning React because chances are a lot of your problems are going to be caused by something being undefined. You named a prop wrong. Console logging it should be your first line of defense. I'm also going to encourage you to destructure your props. I think it's great. There are other people who agree with me, so you don't have to take me at my word. It's going to let you write less code. It's going to write, let you write better documented code. So thank you for watching this video. Let me know if you have any more questions about props. And I'll see you later.